Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Trophy Garden here at Beast Coast Pokemon. I am Aaron Cybertron Zhang, and I'm joined by James Beck and Wolf Glick. And guys, we have a lot to talk about. Of course, the first regional championships in VGC in North America for Scarlet and Violet took place, San Diego Regionals, and you guys both did very, very well with that tournament. I mean, first of all, how are you guys doing? Yeah, doing well. Um, definitely very busy. Yeah, but what else is new? You know, kind of, kind of more of the usual. Um, definitely excited. Got a lot of travel. I think I'm flying six of the next eight weeks, so it's gonna be a bit of a stretch. But um, yeah, feeling good about how things have gone so far, and excited to step into the next phase. Yeah, same. It's uh, pretty busy, especially with all the upcoming events for Series 2. It's like we literally just finished Series 1, like all the tournaments, and we're literally heading on directly to Series 2. It feels so short, and it really was. Yeah, I feel like I've barely even had time to play, like, Series 1. Like, I didn't compete in San Diego, you guys did. And I honestly think it was a really interesting metagame. I wish we had more time to see it develop. But, you know, I want to start off by talking a little bit about San Diego. You guys both top cut that tournament. You guys actually played in top cut, which was, I thought, really cool as well. Uh, and, of course, I commentated the tournament. So how was just the experience overall? You know, first event of the year. Must feel good to, you know, make a deep run in such a stacked tournament. But how'd it go overall? You know, it's it's funny. I I think first of all, I felt really happy to make top cut. Um, like uh, ten rounds at a regional is brutal. I'm sure everyone who played that event would agree. Like nine rounds is already a lot, but that extra round just makes it feel so much harder. Uh, and and the events to take just make it to feel like so much longer. So, um, it was exhausting. I was really happy to make top cut, but I don't know. I feel like at least for me, I was pretty disappointed with top sixteen. Um, just because like. I feel like I did like I got most of the way there and it was just a couple more sets and I, I feel like I dropped the ball a little bit. My the, the person I lost to was really good. Um without a doubt. Um I I played uh, Maluka who ended up winning the whole thing. Um so definitely like, like deserved to win there. But um yeah, like I feel like it's top sixteen is definitely good, but it I I, I felt like I could have gone further, so I was a little disappointed in all honesty. Yeah, no, I agree. I know how you feel. I started the tournament 3-2, which was not exactly a great start. I had to win five in a row in order to make the top 32, and I did, so I was very happy about that, and that probably lessened the blow, but for me, I'm usually, oh, I do always want to try to at least go into the top four at least, or at least, you know, make it in that range, or just win, which is usually what I like to go, so after reflecting a bit, I was like, ah sure top 32 is cool but when you look at a prizing which you only get championship points it's actually funny because they took me to the prizing desk and like they were like <laughs> oh uh, no uh, we got nothing for you and i'm like yeah that's kind of what i expected i was surprised to hear that i would have gotten prizing in the first place i was surprised i was here but yeah so there was that but yeah top 32 it's not a bad start to the year but of course, I would have liked to have gone further, of course, and tried to win. I was very happy with the team that I used. And yeah, so just got to focus on the next couple of events again and hopefully I'm able to do well there. For sure. Yeah, I think it was it was a really fun tournament to watch, honestly. Like, you know, I was my first event casting for the new season and the tournament had a lot more diversity in terms of teams and Pokemon than I expected. I think like a lot of cool, unique strategies that had popped up, I think like People kind of, I feel like, forgot about Garganackle, so it was kind of see, uh, kind of cool to see that win the entire thing, but also just, like, the Pelipper Rain things that had popped up, Baxcalibur doing super well as well. Uh, overall, I thought Series 1 was just a really fun format, so, like I said, I wish I could play for a little bit longer. Uh, we did, of course, have one more Series 1 regionals in Liverpool, which took place this past weekend from the time we were recording this. So I'm curious if you guys tuned into that at all and if you had any thoughts about Liverpool. I didn't watch very closely, but I did see that there was a ton of Pelipper, like, a, like a, just an absolute, um, yeah, like a, just a ton of Pelipper. Um, and I thought that was interesting because like, I didn't see that coming. And I, I was talking to Marcus who, um, I don't know, like, like played in the event and he said he played, I think six or seven rounds consecutively of Pelipper, which is like, not what I would have expected going in. Yeah, there was, I believe, in the top 32, there were 10 Pelippers and 10 Dundozo teams. So, a uh, pretty interesting event. I would have actually, I think it was because most of the teams were ma mainly refined from the San Diego's teams that did really well. Like, Chuppa's team, we kind of saw versions of. We saw uh, Judy's team that did really well with a lot of King Gambit. So, it seemed like it was a lot of those versions. It's not too surprising because... It was pretty much the end, and you're going to go with, like, what is proven to do well. So I 
I don't know if that's like an effect of just the series basically have, has ended after that tournament, but I would have been really curious to see how this metagame developed, but yeah, it, it was pretty interesting. I did get to watch quite a few of the matches and they were really cool to see, especially the Hard Trick Room team. I think Alex Soto used to get second was pretty interesting on because we kind of saw Armourish just go down in usage and uh, Hard Trick Room ended up doing really well at that event and he's played a spectacular Totally agreed, yeah. I, I like think it would have been interesting to see if Series 1 continued to develop, specifically like how Dondozo Tatsugiri would have performed over a longer period of time, because of course it ended up finishing second at Regionals in San Diego, and then it won Liverpool Regionals as well. And so, yeah, uh, wish we had more time with it, but we are moving on to Series 2. Of course, Orlando Regionals is taking place right away in the beginning of February. That will use the Series 2 rule set, so... You guys have any initial impressions of the format? You know, any thoughts on what Pokemon you think might break out, especially at Orlando Regionals in particular, that might come out of nowhere? I have a feeling Gastrodon might pick up. Um, I, I some of my friends were talking about it, and like basically with uh, Gastrodon, you can do a really good job against both Goldengo because you naturally resist Steel um, and Iron Bundle, which because you uh, well you need to use your Terra, but you are obviously immune to water, and with Terra Fire, you um now resist ice as well and and there's no single type in the game that can resist both hydro pump and freeze dry because the only types that resist water are grass dragon and water and all of those are weak to freeze dry and so um i feel like gastrodon might might have a big appearance um here i feel like people are like yeah they, like people like to use gastrodon it didn't see really any play in series one but with how popular iron bundle is going to be oh it also matches up well into iron hands because of the electric immunity right so um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised at all to see Gastron uh, kind of pick up at Orlando. Yeah, I think Gastron's a pretty solid pick. Also, I was talking and seeing like a few people run Covert Cloak to help against Garganical because you actually win the 1v1, which I think is pretty cool. So I think Gastron's a pretty interesting mod. I think some of the Paradox mods, like I actually think a lot of them are pretty underrated. We've seen a lot of probably, I'd say the most common are going to be the Fluttermane and Roaring Moon. But I don't think the other ones are bad at all. Like, I think they all have their own viability. Like, Great Tusk is actually pretty decent. Brute Bunnet is the one that's kind of surprised me the most with how decent it is. Sandy Shocks. I do think that there's a lot of potential for seeing most of the Paradox Mons that are maybe Screamtail. But I think Screamtail can actually function in, like, a very committed Parish Trap team if anyone wants to bring that. But, of course, it is probably harder to use than most other teams you would normally see in the format. Yeah, I've been impressed yeah. with, like, how many... Of the paradox mons like seem strong when i play against them i think it makes sense because they all have the same bst with you know a couple exceptions um so yeah like i think it'll be definitely be interesting to see like i'm sure that there'll be some some weird pair uh some weird um paradox mons uh pop up I, the ones that i really don't believe in are the tyranitar iron thorns and iron jugulus um and the bug fighting volcarona one which is slitherwing yeah those are the three that i feel like are like really bad um but i could i don't know i've been wrong before I think it, like, strikes me as... I, I wouldn't be surprised to see, like, maybe one kind of sneak into top cut, you know, just because I feel like you can have the advantage of people just not having experience fighting against them. But, yeah, I, I haven't actually played the format too much yet myself, so... Um, but I definitely have my eyes out on some of the more, like, niche ones. Like, Sandy Shocks, I think, is really interesting, for example. You mentioned Great Tusk as well, for sure. Seems like Iron Hands has been quite a popular pick. You know, Iron Bundle, uh, I, I expect to, you know, just be seen a lot as well as Fluttermane. Um, but I'm, I'm, one question that I've been wondering myself is, how, like, centralizing do you think the Paradox Pokemon will be? Because I think Series 1 was interesting where, you know, actually even for regionals, like, there were a lot of Pokemon and strategies that I guess maybe I just didn't fully have on my radar. Um, and it was, it was cool to see, yeah, it felt, like, pretty open as a, you know, first tournament of the year. So for Series 2, like, do you think the Paradox Pokemon will quickly centralize the uh, format? Or do you think, you know, they're not that much stronger than the rest of the field? There's a lot of them, right? So I feel like for centralization, a couple would have to like really be better than the rest. Like I have like, I don't know if like, let's say five or 10% of teams have like Sandy Shocks, for example, or like Iron Treads, right? Like I wouldn't consider that like centralizing. So I don't, I don't think it will be like a really central meta. I think that like some of them will be used. I think like you'll need to have answers for, um, I actually think that the two most popular are going to be Fluttermane and Iron Bundle. Um, but Iron Hands is really picked up as well. Um, like, I kind of feel like the big four are Bundle, uh, Fluttermane, Iron Hands, and uh, Roaring Moon. I feel like those are all going to be really popular, and you'll need to have answers for them. But 
like that's already four pokemon and they all like work independently from one another and, and that's not even counting like i don't know like um i've seen some booster energy iron moth for example like that's picking up as well so i don't think it will be super centralizing but i think you'll need to be prepared for i don't think like every team will have like the top most used paradox mom but i think like maybe 30 percent of them will you know yeah I, I think it really just depends on definition of centralization because it's like it will these be like will there all be like teams of like the same four or five i'd probably say not but i could definitely see like two or three being used commonly i think flutter main is probably one of the highest usage iron bundle probably after that and then iron hands it's just i see i'd imagine you see a two or three on like several teams but the partners can really vary i think depending on like what you exactly want to go around and i think these pokemon are just very flexible in how they play if you guys had to guess like how you know what do you think the average number of paradox pokemon will be per team like i, I feel like maybe two personally i said two yeah two to three is what i would say yeah that makes sense and can we talk oh go ahead oh go ahead yeah yeah i was gonna say can we talk about how stupid goldengo is like has it been enough time <laughs> that we can talk about it yet <laughs> i hate it so much it's the dumbest it's, pokemon it's, of all time I, I will say it's it's wild looking at usage stats when you see like meow Scarada and golden go just like being so high up for series one and it makes sense right it's like they're just so freaking good like meow Scarada with focus ass just just so consistent with knockoff and then the overgrow you know flower trick set uh, I, I do think it's pretty cool how quickly uh, overgrow plus like the sash set really took over you know i feel like when the pokemon first came out a lot of people were talking about protean but then yeah sorry your main point was on golden go and I, I think this pokemon is just absolutely bonkers like it does so much damage it can steal terror with choice specs and still survive because it has a ton of bulk uh it can nasty plot as well like this pokemon is just and then it's ability, ability. Like... it's ability is so dumb. oh my, oh my gosh. gosh yeah the fact it, it you is... can't encore it into like nasty plot or protect makes me so mad I don't know. As as someone who actually brought uh, Golden Go to San Diego, <laughs> I don't know. I actually just really enjoyed the fact that it can actually switch into Moongus because it's kind of hard to, unless you have safety goggles or the Terra, it was just like really nice to have it. His typing is just really solid. Uh, I do think Make a Rain is a little bit too strong, but otherwise, I do think it is a pretty fair mana. And especially like Series 1, there weren't as many like you know paradox mons as we see like that have really good coverage against it like flutter main shadow ball uh you had uh the roaring moon a dark type move but it's, yeah it's just really strong in series one and you could cover the weaknesses with uh some decent typings as well as rain which we saw to cover the fire weakness so it was just a really consistent mon it there wasn't really much to say there were so many sets you could also run on it too yeah also i think we agree but we're drawing it. different conclusions where you're like i like using this and i'm like <laughs> i hate playing against this <laughs> Do you think it will continue to be as popular going into series two? Obviously, we are getting a bunch of brand new Pokemon, but how do you think like the you know the introduction of especially like you know something like Fluttermane, for example, affects how Golden Goal usage works? I kind of think Fluttermane is not good in a Golden Go because they just Terra, you do like thirty percent, and then they kill you. <laughs> so I'm not I am not a Fluttermane believer. Um, <laughs> I, I think it will still be big because it's really i think it's really good into um bundle it's good into hands it's maybe not great into moon but it doesn't lose if you have your terra right you just because you terra steel make it rain and moon isn't the bulkiest one and then yeah flutter main i also don't think it beats with with terra so um and uh, i guess adding another basically a moongus clone in like brute bond and having another like four immunity goes up right because we went from one relevant spore mon to two so yeah i think it'll probably still be really popular I think it actually, like, it's going to still be used. It's still a great mon. I do think it's actually weaker in this format because of the, I guess, just more damage output. I think there's definitely counterplay to it, especially with all the different Paradox mons. Like, Sandy Shocks can do a lot of damage to it. You have a great Tusk as well. You have, of course, and the thing is, if they have to commit to tear, you can play around it. So i've tried golden go and it's definitely a lot weaker than i felt like it was in series one just because of like the more damage output and unless you're going for like specs immediately for damage it's a little bit underwhelming otherwise and it's harder to set up nasty plots in this format also like there's pokemon like iron hands just that takes ex pretty much no damage especially if it's the salt vest one and can do a ton of damage to golden go so I do feel that it's still going to be a pretty good mon, but I don't think it's nowhere near as like strong as it was in Series 1. It's still a good mon, though. 
Yeah, I feel like um, it was interesting. You guys were talking about Gastron usage potentially going up. Uh, I was actually kind of surprised to see Gastron not be as popular, but I guess Meow Scarada was everywhere. That being said, the Fire Terra that you mentioned earlier would actually counter it. Um, so, yeah, like, I think if Gastron usage picks up, then you would think, oh, maybe Golden Gold usage then will decrease a little bit, especially if Gastron becomes meta. But, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just eager to see how different Series 2 looks from different one. Um, Like, do you guys think... With the introduction of Paradox Pokemon, it'll look like completely different. Do you think a lot of the cores or strategies that we saw from Series 1 will still be popular? For example, like Dondozo Tatsugiri, the Pelipper stuff that had popped up, Armour Jindidi, you know, Annihilate, uh, plus like Mousehold, for example, Murkrow Tailwind. Like, do you think those archetypes will still be prevalent, or do you think the, the teams will completely, ch like, strategies will just completely change and center more around Paradox Mons? I think it'll probably be a mix. I also think it's kind of hard to judge because, like, the, whenever a new game is released, whenever a new generation is released, I should say, like, things develop really quickly. Like, we already kind of saw this with Murkrow's arc, right? Where, like, game come, like, you know, rules are announced, Murkrow is on, like, it, like, spikes in popularity, it holds there for a little bit, but by San Diego Regionals, it was, like, gone, right? There were two out of top 32, and, like, I think 20% were in top 128, so we went from, like, 20% usage in top 128 to 6% usage in top 32, and... I didn't follow Liverpool super closely, but I didn't see a lot of Murkrow there. Maybe you correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think it did super well at, at Liverpool either. So um, I think like that's kind of a natural course. It's hard to tell. Like I think Mousehold and DD or um, Mousehold um, Annihilate is probably here to stay for a bit because it's just so strong when you get it up and they're both powerful mons on their own as well. Um, and DD Armourage, I would guess, would be around still because it's again very powerful. But yeah, it's, it's it's like I think that like it's hard to say what is because of the paradox Pokemon and what is just natural metagame development, you know? Yeah, I agree. I think that it would probably not be nearly as centralized as because I don't think any of the paradox mods can really like set up anything specific. They're just like straight up attackers, unless you count, I guess, icy wind mainly on iron bundle but i don't think they're like mods that are like oh you can commit to fully supporting them i think they'll just be there and they're like great tools and i think we'll just see like how it develops because i have seen a lot of different teams and it's really just evolving really quickly yeah i think uh especially with the series plus just how many strategies are viable and like scarlet and violet in general like these metas are are so fast-paced right um and so it's exciting, but it's also kind of daunting. I'm like, oh, wow, like I need to sit down and actually learn Series 2 now. It's, and it's, you know, quite different because these new Pokemon kind of dramatically change things. So if, if you're out there listening, like, yeah, it's it's overwhelming for, for everyone, you know. Uh, and so just you got to take it one step at a time, learn the new Pokemon, and then just get experience with it. But I think, um, you know, we've obviously had Scarlet and Violet out for a few months now. And so I'm curious how you guys think the game has held up in general, uh, you know, both in terms of the more maybe casual slash non-competitive experience, whether it be raids or the in-game experience or just, you know, v on the VGC side. Like, I think for me, I've only really been doing VGC stuff, mainly just doing battles online and, you know, uh, trying to think of maybe team ideas, for example. Um, I actually haven't really done that many raids personally, but I'm probably going to have to because I'm running out of resources within the game. Um, but yeah, this like, how, how do you guys think the game has held up? I think like the biggest gripe I had at the beginning is still the biggest gripe now, which is that Terra shards are really hard to get. Like I did a ton when the Deli Bird event was happening. Um, but um, yeah, like it's really hard after doing so many Deli Bird raids. Like I basically got up to like 150 of each type. Uh, but now like it's really hard to go back to the old raiding thing because it's just like so much slower. Um, so I hope they bring back an event that gives you a lot of shards sometime soon. But I think VGC is holding up really well. Like I think this is, I'm having a blast. It seems like, in general, the consensus is that Series 1 is one of the best formats we've ever gotten, if not, like, the best. Um, uh, which is, you know, also a bit biased because it was cut short. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I, I mean, I think I think it's holding up really well. I think it's shaping up for competitive to be really, really fun this generation. I do think VGC has been pretty fun and it has been really keeping up, especially, like, both on the competitive side. You see a lot of users in Showdown as well as uh on the content side on youtube and twitch the numbers are still like pretty high up relative to like what we've seen in prior generations so uh, it looks really really impressive and i really hope it stays that way for a while but yeah as a, as you also for aaron yeah i don't think uh i don't think i've touched the main game at all i still don't <laughs> even think i i don't i don't even think i've gone up to the rune pokemon yet so uh 
I guess maybe I'll wait till like because they said they're patching the game like sometime in late February. And oh boy, I hope that's not like a late July meme like previously. But uh, pretty interested to see what that actually improves. Like, does it actually improve like a casual standpoint? Because if it does, I'd be like going back to probably replay another round, I guess, for a different uh, switch that I have. Yeah, you played through the game like a couple times, you said, right? Uh, yeah, now it's been four times. <laughs> what? It's a big game, James. Damn. Wait, like, <laughs> why? Uh, just multiple accounts on uh, different Nintendo Switch Onlines. I also have to get, like, there is my tournament Switch. There's the Switch I record on. There's, uh, there's another one for, that I have for streaming and something for the other one that I can't remember at the moment. Kudos to you, man. That is, that's actually wild. I don't think I've played any Pokemon game more than like twice in my life ever. Uh, so oh, hearing uh, four for one game is crazy. I don't know. I did Generation <laughs> 7 six times. By Dude, the what? Oh my God. <laughs> that one. I actually, it's funny because I, I kind of enjoyed that. But yeah, like I probably would never want to do that again. It's actually funny because I enjoyed doing Gen 7 six times and I did Gen 8 like two, three times. But if I, I had to it... play Gen 7 six times to keep playing competitive Pokemon, I'd retire, honestly. <laughs> That's a wrap, dude. That's, That's it. Wrap. I'm done. I'm not doing it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's been interesting. I feel like the, the last few weeks or even months, I guess, I don't know about how you guys feel. It's, like, been a blur. Like, I feel like I've been doing so much, both inside of Pokemon and outside of Pokemon, and it's been so productive, but I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, how are we already, like about to enter february you know like starting series two already um and so you know obviously we've all been quite busy with content as well as you know you guys competing and then me commentating in the first tournament so how are you finding like the balance of everything I, I feel like one thing that's interesting reflecting on the time is that i feel like for maybe sword and shield it felt like competitive interest i wouldn't say died down right but it, it felt like maybe after the first month and a half or so uh, it did spike down, you know, a decent amount. Whereas for Scarlet and Violet, it actually feels like there's still a ton of interest, um, and which is like really exciting to see, right? Uh, and so for me, I'm like, oh, I need to keep the momentum up in terms of making content and, and just keeping up with everything. But yeah, how are you all feeling just generally about the, you know, game in terms of content, uh, balancing it with competing as well? It's a lot. Uh, speaking for myself, <laughs> at least it's, it's I'm, I'm very, I, basically like, the last couple months were the hardest I've worked in my entire life. And I told myself, you know, we've got this big event, January 28th, and that's going to be like, I'll push really hard until then. And then after that, I'll take a, like a couple weeks off in February and I'll reassess what my content looks like. But um, I'm like I said, I'm flying every weekend for the next eight weeks, pretty much with one or two weekends off, which I'm doing stuff those weekends, too. I'm just not flying. Um, and, and, you know, because I'm flying so much, that also means that I have to be super efficient during the work week because like, yeah, like there's still a lot to get done. And so, um. Yeah, I, I think I'm like, if not burnt out, rapidly burning out. You know what I mean? Um, I I definitely um, am looking forward to when things calm down a bit. Uh, but who like who knows when that'll be? I mean, the good news is I'm really enjoying the videos that I'm making. Like, I really am enjoying the work. But I think the pace, honestly, the travel pace is just too much because it's like basically half regionals and half weddings. Like, I have a bunch of friends getting married. And so, like, it's it's the weekends that I'm not competing. I am going to weddings um and so yeah it's just it's just a lot in all honesty so um yeah the content is fun and I, I feel really proud of like some of the stuff that we're working on i actually think that the starting tomorrow from when we film this which is when i'm putting out the gym video um i opened a pokemon gym in real life um starting with that i think that is number like the first of the next 10 uploads that i have planned out and that i think it's my strongest catalog of 10 uploads ever which is exciting but i still have to make most of them so uh yeah yeah, geez, I, I'm excited to see what you put out because it's been like the quality has improved a lot, especially from your side. But yeah, like competing balance. Oh, man, I felt like January was kind of tame for me for the most part. It didn't feel like it was too much work, but uh, San Diego, like prepping for it was a little bit hard. But I think this upcoming month is going to be a super busy one for me as I'll be flying to Orlando and that's kind of weird like Battle Stadium is the main content I do and uh when the first regional is like February 3rd to 5th in the first week it's kind of like hard to like you know 
we record a few videos so i might be missing a few uploads or i like i'll have to do it on the february 1st and 2nd so that'll be a little bit hard and then like i'll probably be attending all the australia international and oh boy those are long flights and that's going to be a lot of time spent as well and preparing for that tournament i've been preparing for orlando as well has been pretty grueling there's a lot to learn about the series two and i really want to do well especially because it's going to be a super important tournament especially for australia as it is one out of only three internationals we have this year compared to like four in previous seasons so that will be oh man that that one's really important and i really don't want to mess that one up yeah i'm, I'm glad you brought that up actually um it's it's funny hearing your guys's experiences because i like i feel like i can relate to both uh for me like yeah I, it's just so much travel um between December, January, and February. Um, and, like, some of it is Pokemon-related, a lot of it is just non-Pokemon-related. And it's so fun. Um, but, yeah, I, I think for me, especially in December, I was like, I really want to get out a lot of content. And I was really proud of all the content I was making. I was having so much fun with it as well. And I think I maybe did, like, 27 videos, you know, uh, in the month of December. And even missing, like, one day felt, like, really wild to me. I was like, oh, I feel so bad. And, like, I had the time to make it, but I just, like... So, like, a lot of times I, you know, try to make a video and I'm just, like, not happy with the output and kind of just scrap, you know, uh, the games, for example. Um, or I've I just had feel like, that. Yeah, like, the quality maybe just isn't up to the standard that I'm looking for. Um, but point being, it's interesting because it was, like, such a grindy mindset. And then in January, it's, like, was traveling a bunch as well. Um, and then I was also, like, recruiting for internships throughout all of December as well on top of, like, final exams from school. And, like, so it's like, oh, my gosh, like, learning how to balance all of this is so crazy. Um, and now things are... I want to say they're dying down, but at least like slowing down a little bit. And in January, I'm like giving myself more room to breathe and like, you know, being a little bit more proactive and like, yeah, taking more days off, uh, whatnot, so I can focus on other things. But it's exciting. I'm like, wow, I've never been so invested in like Pokemon, you know, like e even like commentary. I was like, oh, I want to like prepare and make sure I understand the metagame really well and, you know, study and, and get some practice in. Um, so it's a blast. Definitely, uh, you know, a lot going on. But Wolf, you, of course, mentioned your upcoming event, which I think we're all very excited about. Uh, maybe you want to talk a little bit about that because I'm hyped, I'm for, hyped it. for it. Yeah, so it's um, it is Wolf Glicks Pokemon Scarlet and Violet Invitational. I like to keep the names brief. Um, but yeah, basically, we have eight content creators and we've assigned them each a professional coach. Um, and yeah, they're going to it's it's you know, we're, we're it's this Saturday. Um, and I'm really excited. It's like, it's a lot of, um, you know, really talented creators and they, all the coaches are great. And so, um, yeah, like it's, I'm definitely nervous to be, you know, like putting on an event of this, of this size, but we've been working on it since September and I've been thinking about it since way before then. So it's kind of cool that it's all coming to a head. So I'm, I'm leaving for LA on uh, Thursday to get, to get out there to start, you know, get there before the dress rehearsal and stuff. I'm super excited to see, I think, um, you know, one of the craziest things is just looking at how much VGC has grown. And I think, you know, you've been the primary contributor to bringing it, especially to just like the general, you know, I would say like Pokemon fan base rather than the, the hardcore competitive fan base. And I think like, it's just so cool to see the names of the creators involved. And yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'll be there as well, you know, in person, I'm really looking forward to just meeting some of these people uh, in person as, as well as seeing, you know, how the event plays out. I think like, I think about how Ludwig won your last invitational and like he made a YouTube video about it. And I think he got like one or two million views. It's like one of his most viewed videos ever. Uh, and it was like super, super well done, super exciting to watch. And I remember it was like the finals is actually so dramatic. I think it was him and Zane. Um, and, and so I'm eager to see, you know, what teams the, the coaches will have uh, assigned to their their players in this one. But uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah the I remember the quality being like surprisingly high of uh, of gameplay last time, and I was like, oh wait, this is like I was like, I mean, you never really know what you're gonna get, but like, I don't know. Yeah, it's, I think it's cool. Oh man, I'm still I'm saying, man, my boy Mewtwo King would have made it further if he didn't accidentally <laughs> Dynamax Bronzong. He was uh, <laughs> he literally uh, misclicked I, I and Dynamax the wrong Pokemon. <laughs> that was that was rough. Meanwhile, my boy Hugs was the only one who took out Ludwig. In oh yeah, front of the losers. Well, I actually got to see him at San Diego. That was awesome to see him at San Diego and do. I the missed him. I felt well. so bad. I like really wanted to see him, but I like just didn't couldn't figure it out. Oh yeah, we were all super busy for that tournament, but I am excited to watch this one as well. It is series one, right? It's series one. Not yeah, series it's two. series one because it's still January, so I figured we should like do what what they're doing too. Yeah, that makes sense, and it'll be probably more interesting, I think, with the developed teams as well. So should be exciting. Yeah, agreed. Is it single limb or is it? Uh, it pulls into into. Actually, is it? It pulls into um seeding. 
top four pools? bracket into. I actually am oh, blanking oh. now on if it's uh, single or double. I think it's just pools into single elimination, as I recall. Okay, I mean, I that's still a really good format compared to just like regular single, and we get more matches to watch. So very excited to see. Will all the matches be recorded or all of the? Yep, never everything streamed? we streamed. All every okay. single every single match we have will be streamed. That is awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Thanks. Cool, guys. I think, um, yeah, that was like the main list of topics I think we came into today wanting to discuss. But before ending, I wanted to ask some rapid fire questions, you know, get some some quick thoughts on some questions I'm, I'm just personally have. So first one, what Paradox Pokemon do you think will be the most popular in terms of top cut at Orlando Regionals? Ooh, Iron Hands. I'll go with, I think, Iron Bundle. What do you think, Aaron? I know you're not a Flutter main believer, but I, I do think a lot of people are going to use it. And so <laughs> from like a statistical Garbo. standpoint, you know, I'm, I'm going to go with Flutter main. But I like it. We have three different answers here. So we'll be able to you know circle back in a few weeks and see what the right answer was out of that. Second question, what Pokemon from Series 1 was popular do you think is going to have the biggest drop off in terms of usage? And let's say it's for top, we can we can either look at it for like overall tournament or top cut um you can answer whatever one you think is you know more interesting me ask Arata for sure I, I just have not seen it anywhere at all in series two so far i've seen it like once and i think like joe has done well with it decently on online tournaments getting like first and second at a, the online tournaments but otherwise i just never see it anymore because it's just so hard to use with like flutter main iron bundle and a bunch of others yeah, I think Meowth or Murkrow, depending on if you like when you count Murkrow. <laughs> yeah, I feel like uh, I also had Meowth as my answer, so it looks like we are in unanimous agreement there. Um, although I, so I'm curious, like you know, Dondozo. Do you think it's like it, it was interesting because I wouldn't even say it was like super popular, but you know, it did well, right? Like it literally almost won both series one regionals, and so yeah, where do you think Dondozo? What's gonna what's gonna be the state of Dondozo going into series two? Is it still gonna be like this is like the first thing I have to counter when building in the format? Is it gonna see usage at all? What's the deal with Dondozo? I think it'll see usage for sure. I mean, it's so strong, right? It should see usage, but. Um, I don't think it's going to be like the way that it was, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I, I think that it's definitely, I think a lot of the paradox mons match up pretty favorably into it in all honesty. So I, I wouldn't expect it to be as popular as it was at like its peak, you know, but I, I think it will, it should still be good. Right. I mean, it's still Dendozo. I think it's still very solid. I do think it won't be like as high usage as it was in series one, but I still think it's really solid mainly because it's really hard to prep for. Tatsugir is still a great mon with, even like outside of Dundozo itself giving the boost. And yeah, again, as Wolf said, like a bunch of the Paradox Mons decently match up to it. Like Iron Hands can still do a decent chunk. You got to watch out for Freeze Dry from Iron Bundle because that can do a lot of damage. You have stuff like Chilling Water that's been picking up in a bunch of different like water types just to lower the attack on Dundozo. And then, yeah, just a lot of damage from like stuff like Flutter Main or Great Tusk and Sandy Shock. So. Yeah, it's definitely a lot harder to use because of the increase in power, but I still think it's a really solid mon that people should still be prepared for. Love it. Okay, last question. This is just a more, you know, generic one. Uh, you don't have to think as hard about it, but yeah, what can people expect from you all for the next few months? I know you you both alluded to some cool things. Wolf with like your slate of content that's coming out. James, you mentioned you're going to be competing in OCIC, but kind of, you know, what what are the the big picture goals that you all have set for yourselves in the upcoming months within Pokemon? I would say for me, just um expect a lot of good content. That's like the first thing I would say. Um yeah, got a lot of got a lot of banger videos in the works. Um, and then hopefully some hopefully some decent tournament results as well. I'll be going to I won't go to uh, OCIC Australia Internationals, but I will be going to um a bunch of the uh like other stuff like um most like I'm going to Orlando and, and Knoxville regionals and and probably Fort Wayne and Charlotte as well. Um, so yeah, just gonna be just gonna be a busy guy. You know how it is. I'll be going to a lot of tournaments, uh, OCIC, Orlando, Vancouver, pretty much the ones I'm already heading for. I'm, I'm, I might do Knoxville, but uh, I kind of don't want to do three tournaments in a single month because uh, you burn out really fast that way. And I've already experienced that in the past in 2019. So I'm going to probably still go to a lot of tournaments still and content wise, still pretty much going to be the same. I'm going to be doing a lot and I'll be experimenting with a lot of different formats and videos and see how that goes and i have some projects in the work that are 
uh, coming up. So I'm pretty excited about those. But how about you, Aaron? Share what you're going to do. Yeah, I uh, like December and January is such a blur because I was so busy with uh, like internship recruiting as well. And I'm like finally done with that. So it feels really good. Um, and so like, yeah, I know what I'm going to be doing for the summer, uh, which is really exciting. And so now I can focus a little bit more on yeah, Pokemon instead of like interview prep. Um, and so I, I'm planning on getting back into competing. I was hoping to go to Orlando regionals and play, um, but definitely gonna, you know, mix playing and commentating throughout the season. But I'm, I'm just excited to play in a tournament again. I think it's, you know, been been quite a while and I definitely still have the competitive itch. And especially seeing you guys, like, you know, Top Cut San Diego, I was like, I want to be there with, with my boys, you know? And so um, that's, that's definitely one of the goals as well. And, you know, would love to qualify for Worlds this year, but just got to take it one step at a time. So, yeah. I think that's all we have for this episode of Trophy Garden. So thank you so much, as always, for joining myself, James, and Wolf. We all have lots of exciting things planned for you all coming up in the future. And so, yeah, stay tuned.